Spotlight Georgetown. I'm Beverly Enos and this is Spotlight Georgetown. You can find us Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. on your local cable station. It is your cable station, so if you would like to be part of it, come join us. I'm always looking for people to do interviews. If you would like to learn how to use the equipment, do some editing, run a camera, just let us know and we'll take care of that for you. Now today we're talking to Paul Jansen, and you're from Georgetown. I am. And how long have you been in town? Um, 17 years now. Oh, that's quite a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you and your wife yes. both work at Lawrence Hospital? At Lawrence General Hospital up in Lawrence, yes. And what do you do there? Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician um, in the emergency department there. And my wife is um, an emergency medicine physician in the same department. It's been... Uh, three, four years now, and it's the first time in a long time we've worked in the same place. Um, and uh, the, fortunately, the emergency department is large enough so we can work the same time and never even see each other. But, now, how crazy does it get up there in the emergency um, room? <coughs> it can get pretty crazy. I've been in there a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, it can get crazy. It is um, sometimes a cross between total boredom and total mayhem. Um, the part of the problem with emergency medicine is that it's about emergencies. It's also about what people think are emergencies or have to access um, health care somehow. So we'll see a lot of sore throats and sprained ankles and cuts and so on in between the heart attacks and uh, shootings and, and so on like that, you know. And uh, I wouldn't recommend it as a primary source of your health care for that reason. It's, uh, it's now They're opening urgent mm -hmm. cares up in Lawrence as well. That's true. So uh, does that take some of the people um, off your floors? It hasn't impacted us too much yet. I think there's a, a certain, what shall we say, a learning curve for the patient, for the population to learn that uh, that the urgent care is available, what they can handle. Right, they can take care can of the sprained ankles yeah, they can, and the and sore And sore throats. throats. And they can probably take care of about 50% of what we see in the emergency department. If you've broken your ankle, you'll need to be in the emergency department. Now it's but funny course, because I broke my wrist uh -huh. this, this past summer. And I know it was broken. Mm -hmm. It was the middle of the night, and I mm -hmm. said, okay, what do I do? I put an ice pack on it, I wrapped it in an ice bandage, and mm -hmm. I waited till the urgent care opened. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. in and out of there in 15 minutes mm -hmm. with my mm -hmm. x-ray and an appointment to put a cast on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that works very well. Wrists are going to be casted. Ankles that are broken usually require surgery. Right. But those are subtleties that, you know, that you don't necessarily expect everyone to yeah. be. You know. Most <coughs> of the, the TV shows that they have about emergency rooms, it looks like it's always, uh -huh, it's uh -huh. always busy, busy, busy. Yeah, not yeah. quite there. No, no, no. Okay. And, and I, I like to point out that the quickest patient I've taken care of would not fit in to the time slot on the TV show. Um, <laughs> okay. <you know. laughs> Um, just the paperwork alone will take, you know, half an hour to an hour to get and, everything through. And the insurance company. <coughs> and the insurance and all of that. Um, they're always through two or three patients in, a, whatever, 48 minutes they have allotted, plus all of the extra stuff that they do yeah. to keep the show interesting. So that's not the way it's it not, is. It's not the way it is. <laughs> now, you have a home on Elm Street, and some, somebody crazy. told me it's a hidden treasure. Um, I like to think of it as a treasure. It certainly is hidden. Um, it's um, back off Elm Street um, at 36. Am I allowed to give the address? Or yeah. Will people mob my home? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, we, have, um, we have 16 acres back there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. On Elm Street? On Elm Street, yeah. It's, um, it's not, the house is not visible from the road. Okay. It is marked, you know. Um, uh, but the, um, the home sits in the middle of the 16 acres and actually abuts the, uh, the Penbrook School in okay. back, even right. though it is several numbers down from, from where the Penbrook driveway is. Um, 
and you have <coughs> you have family pets there. <laughs> we have, have <laughs> well, we have chickens. Yes, we have a rabbit. Um, we have uh, two dogs um, and a cat. And uh, those are all just, the typical or, things. All those yeah. are. But yes, we raise chickens. Um, and Do you sell we, the eggs? We sell the eggs. We give the eggs away sometimes. We don't eat the chickens. I, you know, um, interesting story of how we came to have chickens. My now 24-year-old daughter, Maria, um, was in first grade, and their science project was to hatch eggs. And they hatched the eggs and got six chicks. And then the teacher told them that they would be giving them back to the farmer who was raising. And someone asked what would happen to the chicken. And my daughter came home and said, we have to keep the chicken. And we had an old chicken coop on the property, so we ended up with those six. Now those are, have since passed. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't live that long. But we've replaced them. And lately we've become the final home for several people at my work who thought they would like chickens and found out that they really <laughs> My son has chickens for his yeah. kids. Yeah, the yeah. kids love it. Yeah, the kids yeah. really yeah. love it. Mm -hmm. They play with yeah. the chickens in the backyard. Yeah, and yeah. no, it's great, and they they really, they're um, the roosters are incredibly noble animals. They will actually go up against the dogs, if wow. if the dogs. One time that one of the dogs got into the coop, and the roosters just you know kept him at bay until I got him out and, and everything. Um, chickens do come home to roost. If you let them out and run around, they'll come back and they'll roost in their home. Um, yeah. And they're not expensive to keep. It really is chicken feed. The, you know, the 50-pound bag is like $6 and stuff. And we get the eggs. We haven't, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. Something different. Yeah. Now, amongst other, the other things you do, you're a writer. Yes, I am. You have written for newspapers? Yes. Which yes, newspapers? Uh, local? Um, local. Um, I wrote for a humor column for the Port Planet up in Newburyport mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, I think they've s moved on to um, uh, an electronic uh, only okay. paper. I've written a couple of articles, um, one of which was actually picked up by the Peoria Star out in Peoria, <laughs> Illinois. I don't know how they even found it, but they published it. Um, I came across an article I had on uh, uh, on uh, the internet, on a history uh, uh, site, um, about the Texas uh, War of Independence and how it mirrored uh, various parts of manifesto. It was you know, kind of a, uh, and it was referenced by a teacher in California for her advanced studies history class, and they were asked to critique. I had no idea that this was happening. I was looking it up. It gave me kind of a chill that people were actually studying it. <laughs> Reading it is one thing, but studying it, I don't know. So yeah. anyway, yeah, I've, I've had a great time. And then that. you write novels. I write novels. You have, yeah. you have one coming out yes. in the near future at some point. Yep. Um, malpractice? Malpractice, yes. And now, uh, this is the cover. Is, it's, the, it's a novel. It's a novel. Okay. It is a mystery of murder and medicine. It says that right on the cover. <laughs> take you to write a book? Um, the last one I just completed, and I, I haven't completed it because I have to go through and rewrite it and everything like that, it took me about two and a half months. Wow. Yeah. Now, I should say that is the actual typing in. The story was written for about six months before that as I drove back and forth to work, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, I think I'll have Frank say this, you know. And, so, and that's where a lot of what I do, in, including the, the books we're going to talk about, is while I'm driving or while I'm sitting around, I'll kind of think about it and I'll just kind of... I design some of, artwork, yeah. I do the same thing. Yeah. It has to sit there and roll around a little bit yeah. Yeah. before you can yeah. actually yeah. put it out there. Right, yeah, yeah, and you have to do that. And uh, with art as well, or with writing, and I'm sure it's true with art, although I don't have that experience. With the writing, it doesn't always come out the way you thought it was going to. You same, know, you, same story. Yeah, right. You know, you're you writing along and you're saying, 
no, Sally is not so stupid as to do that. <laughs> He's going to have to, you know, or you end up having to go back into the story and say, well, you know, I want it to be, so I have to change that. I have to have the house red now because of, and okay. that sort of stuff. And yeah. people forget there are a lot of details in a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to make sure that it flows. Right, right. Now, you also have a novel called Scratch? I do, yes. And I have to plug that a little bit. Um, the story idea was um, Jeff Borgini who runs the ice cream shop down next to Noonan's, okay. Ken Borg's. Um, the story is about a cat that is able to perceive that people are ill. And when the cat perceives it, the cat scratches the person. The person goes to the emergency department and the illness is discovered and treated. And that's the premise okay. behind it. It's a tween novel, they call it, for mm -hmm. late teenager, uh, late preschool, pre-teenage into the teenage years. Okay, that, uh, that sounds yeah. interesting. Yeah, it, it is, it is. I think now, it's Now, you have something that you're trying to do with restaurant containers. Yes, yes. Um, I, uh, um, and this gets into the philosophy of, of my life. Um, uh, I adopted two children because I wanted to have a family. I adopted internationally because my wife and I wanted to be part of the world. Um, we wanted to have a family and that was our primary motive. I work at Lawrence General because I feel that's a place that is in need of health care. My wife and I honeymooned in Appalachia. We spent a year working in a clinic in eastern Kentucky because that was a place of need. Um, the pouch idea um, is based on the idea that people shouldn't be taking home styrofoam or even recycled containers from the restaurant with their leftover meal. They should be taking home their meal in a reusable container that they can take to work and then they can wash and they can take back to the, to the restaurant. So I've designed and I'm trying to find a person to market it, a pouch, that thermal pouch with the containers fit into it, and uh, the logo on the pouch is um, save the planet one meal at a time. And the idea is just as the reusable uh, bags from the supermarket, you pay a little money and then bring them back and bring your groceries in rather than the plastic. It's the same kind of an idea. Okay, so um, you use the pouch, take your empty container with you to the yeah, restaurant, right. your leftovers would go in that, yes. and then you take it home. And yeah, and, and then you put it in the refrigerator. There's a, the ones we have have a little dial on it that you can put down the day that it went in. And then you take it in the same container to eat at home, eat at work, whatever, wash it up and put it back in the pouch. It would be a lot easier than those white styrofoam things. It would be, yeah. And I, I just to plug a little bit, um, the best way to Recycle is to reuse. Don't send, take it to the recycling place if you can actually reuse. The, definitely take it to the recycling place rather than throw it into the trash. You know, but even the recycled containers, the fiber containers, are trash. They're going to be thrown into right. the trash, and and this is not. And that's the idea behind it. Yeah, okay, yeah. now you write songs as well? I do, I do. Um, so well, you're kind of a man of all talents here. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> and through all this, you've had muscular dystrophy. I have, indeed. And yes. how long have, has that been? Well, it's something I was born with. Okay. Um, it, uh, it's a genetic disorder. Um, I, looking back, um, was showing some of the symptoms when I was in high school. Um, I have two had, I should say, both of them had passed away, two brothers with the same disease. Um, and um, my older brother was quite badly affected in high school. Um, I am at this point beginning to notice that I you know, can't run up the stairs any longer and so on like that. I'm fortunate that it has not, that it is not um, more severe than it is. And as I said, both of my brothers, my older and my younger brother, have uh, have died of, of the complications of the disease. So, okay. Yeah. Now, the reason that I originally contacted you, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the adoption and the book yeah. that you wrote mm -hmm. about all of that. Yeah. Now, 
Where did the girls come from? You said you were adopted internationally. Yes, they came from Quito, Ecuador. I have been there. Oh, have you? Yes. It's, yes. On my way to Galapagos. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we had to spend two weeks there um, during the adoption process, and it's a very nice place. It very is. Nice place, yes. It's a very nice yeah. little place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We saw some of the orphanages, which probably weren't on your uh, tourist list. No. No. But, um, but yes, it's a very, very uh, pleasant city there. And uh, we got to drive up into the mountains. I, uh, um, I am told that uh, the mountain top that we went to on the Colombian border, and I wish I could remember the name, but anyway. If you measure the height of a mountain from the center of the earth as opposed to from sea level, which is how Mount Everest gets to be the tallest mountain, it's the highest above sea level. But if you actually measure from the center of the earth, because the earth is spinning, the sea level is slightly higher at the equ uh, equator than it okay. is at the pole. And so I've been on the highest, the highest mountain. mountain. In <laughs> we drove up in a car. I could barely breathe, it was so high, but I've been there, so. <laughs> now, what is the name of the book? What are the name of the girls? The girls are Emma um, and Maria, Emma Elizabeth and Maria Jose. They do not use their middle names now, but. And uh, how old are they now? They are 25, uh, 24 and 25. And when you got them, how old were they? They were three and five. Okay, and you wrote a book about this whole thing. I did, I did. Um, the book was actually written, um, as we were talking about. Um, uh, it was written shortly after they arrived, and it was a synthesis of my philosophy about family, about adoption, and all of the Spanish words that I knew. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, they spoke only Spanish um, when they came to live with us. They knew two words in English. They knew Barbie, and they knew Mickey Mouse, and Mickey Mouse was one word. Okay. Um, they're much better at language acquisition at that age, and probably would be today, too. Um, but I remember when they were here about six weeks, uh, when they went from speaking Spanish with the English words thrown in to speaking English with Spanish words. Oh, that's fast. Yeah, and they, they, you know, might have been... That's very fast. Yeah, it might have been seven weeks, but it wow. was very, very quickly. Um, and then they gradually got very uninterested in speaking Spanish. I remember uh, when, when... And that's how my wife and I actually got into emergency medicine was so that we could work evenings and nights and the other one could take care of that. And we did not really have to have much in the way of, uh, of outside childcare um, because of that. But one of the things we used to do is that my wife worked at a different hospital, so she would drop the children off at my end of my shift and go on to her job, and I would finish up where I was. And I remember one um, evening, not at Lawrence, it was down at, at Malden, I was discharging a patient, and I was explaining in Spanish, and I speak hablo poquito español, in Spanish what he had was a sprain of some sort, and my daughters were so annoyed at me that I was oh. speaking Spanish to this man who obviously could speak English, and he couldn't, you know, he was Spanish speak, and they at that age had no idea that there were people in the United States that didn't speak English because, and they, they, you know, became Americanized there, you know, joined to all their friends on the internet and the cell phone and everything. And, um, you know, they're probably more Americanized than I am. And they now, certainly. what's the name of the book? The book is The Child in Our Heart, and this is a picture of one of the children and of me, and this is um, Beyonce Knowles. Oh, it's, no, it's Mary. <laughs> they look so much alike. <laughs> but anyway, this is the book. Um, it was written by me, and the illustrations were done by a fellow that I found on the internet who's now living in Wisconsin named Kevin Gearman, okay. and that's what it looks like from the inside. Yes. Okay, now, what is the story in this? This is, um, again, I say about the philosophy of, uh, of adoption. I really think that uh, you know, we are part of the world, 
um, that um, all children are our responsibility, um, that family is family regardless of how it comes together. And it's simply a matter of deciding on the part of the parent that they want to take a special responsibility for one, two, however many children there are. Um, and that all parenting, certainly all adoption, begins with a child that is in your heart. The desire to be a parent, the desire to have a family, the desire to whatever, but it is a child in your heart that begins this process. And that we have to realize that the child is part of the family, whether they are naturally born, whether it is through test tube, in vitro fertilization, whether it is adoption, that it is all the same process. Um, and that's basically what the story is, is about. That there is a mother and father, Mary and I in this case, or any mother or father, that have children in their heart. And I don't go into the reasons, I just say they look around, <coughs> they can't find the child anywhere, they go to an agency, the lady at the agency says, I know who will know, call someone, they know the child, they go, and it turns out to be the child that was in their heart all along. Now you have different versions of this for different types of families. That's true, yes. Um, I have one uh, uh, for a single mother, um, and I have one for uh, two mothers and two fathers, um, one for single fathers, um, and uh, um, I have uh, translations into Spanish, um, and then one for the main book into Italian, um, because we went to Italy this past December and I wanted to give them to the people who were, who were letting us stay with them. Um, it's part of the philosophy that I have about families, that families come in all different shapes and sizes, the parents come in different ways, the children come into the family in different ways, but it is all a family, it is about the desire to have a family, to have children, to devote yourself to caring for, to raising uh, children. and that it really matters very little, um, the details, if you would, whether it's two mothers or a mother and a father or a single parent or, or Spanish-speaking or Italian. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Now, you have a website with the, all kinds of things on yes, it. Right. Can you give us your website? Um, it's very difficult. You may want to write this down. It's pauljansen.com. <laughs> okay. You have to be careful about the spelling of Jansen, it's J-A-N-S-O-N, right. which is a little unusual. But yeah, that will have the books available, it will connect you to, um, to the music and, and so on like that. So, so it's a little uh, bit of everything for <coughs> yeah, you. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, my, you know. And I have written several thoughts, short pieces on what adoption means, and, um, and those can be accessed on the, on the website as well. Thank you very much. Okay. It's been great having you here. Okay. Thank it's you been for joining great us today. To be here. It's uh, it's always interesting to meet people that you think you know everyone in town, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a whole new person that you well, didn't even know was here. Yeah, it's uh, 16 acres. It's a, a, a hidden true. hidden treasure. That's true. So if not the land, maybe I'm the hidden treasure. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Beverly Enos. You've been watching Spotlight Georgetown. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget. Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Bye for now.